Hello, everybody. And welcome. So you made it through TC. Almost, almost. Thanks for spending an hour with me. This is the science of data visualization. My name is Larry Silverstein. I'm a strategic sales consultant at Tableau. I've been with Tableau for five years, and 12 years before that, I was with another business intelligence company. And honestly, I did some regrettable things back then. Don't get nervous. From a visualization perspective, I'll give you a story. So we were working with a car company, and we thought it would be really cool to make a dashboard that looks like a dashboard with gauges and dials and meters and all other kinds of embellishments. And we showed it to the executives, and guess what? They loved it for about a day. Because even though it had that coolness effect the first time they looked at it, over time, it became cumbersome to look at. There wasn't a lot of information on it because of the clunkiness of those large ga gauges and dials. So adoption suffered. So over time, I, I came to Tableau, and I really started to embrace the science of data visualization. And I'm happy to share some of my journey with you today and what I've learned. So today's session is kind of a twofer. The first part is the science of data visualization, but I don't want this to just be a TED talk, where it's, you walk out with a feeling of, well, that was really cool. I also want you to walk away with some practical ideas that you could apply. And in fact, as you're watching this presentation, I challenge you to think about a visualization that you might have done, where when you showed it to people, maybe you didn't get the result you wanted, meaning you know, maybe people didn't understand what you were trying to say. Because my goal is to make, you, make your viewers go from that face on the left, where people are confused, to the right, where they have that aha moment. And you might see some slides you'd like, and I'd like to remind you, you probably know by now, these slides will be available to you on the TC Live website after conference. So let's get into the science of data visualization, and we're going to start out with some warm-up exercises before I get all scientific on you. So here's an example, a real example plucked from the web. A really eye-popping graphic, wouldn't you say? A 3D pie chart. But look at it for a moment. You'll see that there are some real problems with this visualization. Now, there are times when you might want to do something that's eye-popping. Don't get me wrong. Maybe you're a blogger, and you want people to be drawn into your website. But when you do stuff like this, you might lose credibility. Because if you look at this, you see, for example, America is up higher than Africa, but America's is 11%, and Africa's 18 That doesn't seem right. Or compare America's to China, 11% to 13%. I don't know. America's looks bigger to me. So I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but one of the things you'll hear throughout this presentation is really the, the bar chart is your friend in many cases when you want to make comparisons. So here you can quickly see, for example, that you know, India is about twice as much as China in terms of growth. And it's sorted, so you can easily make those comparisons. And here's an example that you're probably all more familiar with, the crosstab report. It's great when you need to look up specific information. But let's say you gave it to an executive, and their job was to figure out which is their least profitable subcategory. They could do it, but it's going to take a long time. So they may not bother. This is not going to be very effective. Now, I'm going to give you a visual cue to make it a little bit better. So now, we see the negative values in red. So that's a cue. And we're going to talk about you know, which cues work better than others. But this isn't perfect yet. 
not that any of this can ever be perfect, but the problem is, is that you still have to do some mental arithmetic. You gotta hold those values in your memory. And if there were more rows and columns, it would become an even more complicated task. So here's a more delightful version now where we're, we've made it more visual. Now, you don't even need the numbers, but you can tell by the color of the bars and the orientation of the bars that it's those darn tables. So anybody who uses Superstore knows there's always a problem with tables. Uh, so there you go. You don't really need the numbers. So just to get you warmed up here, let's play a game called Count the Nines. Shout out, how many nines are in here? Somebody already saw this viz, but you happen to be right, but I'll pretend I didn't hear the answer. <laughs> but if I then give you a visual cue, the answer that we heard a moment ago, shout it out if you've counted it up. How many noise are there? I hear 10, that's correct. It's pretty obvious, well you made it red, it made it easier, but we're gonna talk a little bit further about why that is. Another game we're gonna play, where this is a little more complicated, Let's say you're um, a sales director for the entire country and somebody gives you this report, and this looks like a typical report, lots of numbers, and let's say that it's X is your store sales in millions, Y is your store profitability in millions, and one, two, three, four across the top are your regions, north, south, east, west, whatever. All right, sales directors for the country, you've got this great data. What's your next move? I know, I know. You're saying to yourself, come on, be fair, Larry. Give me some stats. Give me means, variances, correlation coefficients. All right, I'll give it to you. Almost exactly the same in every case. Sometimes to within several decimal places. Now what's your move? Still hard to tell. Anybody know what this special data set is called? My last audience was smarter than you guys. I'm just kidding. It, it's called Anscombe's Quartet. So Francis Anscombe was a famous statist statistician from the 1970s, and he constructed this data set to prove a couple of things. First is that to truly understand your data, it's really impactful to visualize it, and that's what we're all about, data visualization. He also wanted to show the impact of outliers on an overall data set, and that's why we got some of those funky results before where they all seemed exactly the same. But let's say now you're that sales director and you're given this visual report. You might look at the lower left-hand corner and say, whoa, there's that one store that's doing really well. Let's find out what they're doing and drive up the others. You could do something actionable. Same thing with the lower right-hand corner, forget that, <laughs> that outlier is way, way out there, but the ones above the line, you might wanna talk to those stores and figure out what's better. And what if you can encode more data into this visualization, such as the size of the circle might be a different measure like your discounting. And you might wanna use color to represent your product categories and show more information. Well, that's kind of what Tableau is all about, right? So let's get into the science a little bit. What we want to do in an effective visualization is to get people to use what's called the visual cortex. That's the part of the brain that allows you to quickly see things. Now, there is time to use the cerebral cortex, but remember, we want people to look at our visualizations and within five seconds understand what it's about. It's not about deep thinking. So let's figure out how we can exploit that. How many of you have seen this slide or something similar to it? Fair number, not too big. So these are called pre-attentive attributes. These are the things that, just like the name says, before we really pay attention to something, it stands out, whether it's size, orientation, length, color, and so on. Now, we're gonna find out a little bit later in the presentation that some of them are more powerful than others, but it kinda depends on the situation, so hold on to that. But these are the things we want to exploit. 
So let's touch on some of the other facets of you know, data, uh, the science of data visualization. Like we, we have memory limits. Here's an example. Suppose I gave you this table of data and asked you a couple of questions. Have we gained or lost customers over the last four years? Well, that first question is really easy because I gave you a total line, and you can see 1550 compared to 1779, it's gone up. We've gained. Great. But if I ask which city has grown the fastest, that's a little bit harder. But what if I were to give you a chart? That's the same data. Now it stands out. Austin really has improved the most, right? But why is it that this is so much more effective? It probably seems obvious to you. The idea here is, is that, well, the human brain can really only hold about six numbers you know, in our registers, right? About six. But when I gave you that table excluding the total line, that's 16 values. That's a lot more than six. But by creating that chart, I've chunked each of those rows into one line, and I encoded it with a color. Now we can easily differentiate between those patterns. So let's talk about some ways that we can overcome our memory limitations. So this was actually ripped off the web. It's a little bit cut off on the screen here. There's a website called viz.wtf, I kid you not. And it also said underneath, classic case of would be better as a bar chart. But the point I want to make here is, is that you know, the user meant well. They're trying to give you a lot of information. But by making a big pie chart with two circles on the inside, that it's no longer something that we're fami familiar with. And the encoding is not really intuitive at all. For example, we got those two things in the middle, those two circles total internet users and high-speed internet users, circle within circle. As people, we have a hard time understanding sizes and you know, areas of circles. So is that outer circle really about three times as big as the inner one? Hard to tell. And there were some other issues here, like all those labels pointing to things. And we have India, we see the number, and then there's something that says countries outside of the top 20. Which one is bigger? It's really hard to tell. So this is like a pseudo donut chart, but not exactly. Now, you can build this in Tableau, but it wouldn't be following visual best practices. So since somebody had commented would be better as a bar chart, I wanted to prove that it is. And I wanted to show pretty much exactly what this author was trying to show. So I have a bar chart sorted, but at the top, I represent those two big circles. And then at the bottom, I have the countries outside of the top 20 is a special case. And I use a different color, but now I can easily compare that to India, which I couldn't tell before. I can see it's just a smidge lower in terms of users. Interruptions also slow us down. First, I'm going to give you an example from the real world, and then one that is from the viz world. So I'd like you to study this picture for a moment. I'm going to block it out, and I'm going to make a change, and I want you to tell me what has changed. Study. Here we go. Interruption. And we're back. Anybody? Can anybody tell me what has changed? Shadow, you said? Nope. The leaves, you happen to be right. You're, you're more, either you've seen it before, you're more perceptive, but very well done. I mean, most people would know that subtle thing, right? You see that? All right, really subtle. All right, all right, that was fun. But what's the, what am I trying to get to? So very often I see these paradigms where people make a dashboard that drills from, one to the, from dashboard one to dashboard two. And by the way, with those new buttons that you saw a couple of days ago, that's going to make that really easy. But before we get there, um, I'm going to start with the end in mind where we see some product information and some order details. And the thing is, is that when I, when I get here, 
unless I really know my product hierarchy well, I might no, not know what category or subcategory I started at or what segment we started with. So now I'll show you the beginning just to prove that point. So here we are in a typical drillable dashboard. I'm going to drill into one thing, into another. You know, I, this is a common paradigm. It's a good paradigm. Uh, and then you have something, a link, a hyperlink that says, you know, go to see that detail. And then we get there. And that, that's the point I'm trying to make. We kind of lost something. We lost our context as we jumped from dashboard to dashboard. So, you know, where possible, try not to, you know, block out the user like that. Try to give them the detail on the same page if there's enough room to do so. All right, let's get into some of the finer detail around topics like color, data types, chart types, and layouts. Everybody wants to know, what's the right chart type to use? We're not going to be dogmatic here, but I'm going to give you some generalizations, and we'll go from there. So Tableau comes with many, many color templates, and you could create your own. But let's just break it down, and we'll just generalize here two types of templates. There are the more muted or standard colors and emphasis colors. And I caution you against using emphasis colors. And, and we see them all the time. The problem is, well, for one thing, colors mean different things to different people, especially when you think about different countries. So for example, in the United States, red bad, green good. But in China, red means good fortune. So they're going to take something else away from that. But also remember that roughly 8% of men and 4 tenths percent of women are what we commonly call colorblind, but really is color vision, vision deficiency, or CVD. So here we can see the normal vision on the left, and then different opias, deuteranopia, and so on. Depending on whether you have trouble seeing green, red, or blue, and that happens to correspond to problems with your medium, long, and short range cones in your eyeballs. And there are websites out there uh, that you could take your viz and you submit it to that website, and it will actually tell you, this is what a person with, let's say, protonopia, this is how they would see it. Funny quick story, I delivered the same presentation a couple of days ago, and after I was done, somebody came rushing down to the podium, and they were really concerned. They said, go back to your slides again on CBD. I want to see that again. He thought he was going colorblind. <laughs> I told him, it's probably just the monitor or something, so don't get nervous. But please don't make any health decisions about yourself based on this slide. So back to the, those emphasis colors. So you know, here's the problem with using them. So on the chart on the left, now, I don't know if 400,000 is a good thing like sales or a bad thing like unemployment, but yet our brains are fooled, even if momentarily, because we see Slovakia is red, at least in the United States, that would be our takeaway, and that the Czech Republic is green. But there's really no meaning attached to the color, so it slows people down. It makes it harder to understand. On the right-hand side, I'm using a neutral color. I'm telling the story effectively. I sorted the bars. That's all you need to know. We call this problem double encoding, so try to stay away from it. It may look pretty, but like I said, you're doing yourself and your viewers a disservice. It's sometimes OK. Just be thoughtful when applying color to bars. So if you wanted to group by you know, a type or something, by a category, that's fine. That'll work. That could be useful. And take caution if you must use a background to your viz. So if I were to ask you which one of those inner boxes, inner squares, is darker, how many of you think the one on the left? You know what the answer is going to be, right? How many of you think it's the one on the left is the darkest? Be honest. All right, some people are honest. Other people are looking at their, how their 
plane is doing. Okay, but if you draw a square around them, they're all the same. And we're going to see this problem pop up a little later when we get to mapping. And too much color can be another thing that slows people down. Just like we can only remember about six different numbers, we can only distinguish around eight colors. So if I've got a scatter plot and I put states onto color, you're not going to get a useful pattern. But if we keep it to eight or less, like we have here, now patterns emerge. You see clusters. This is useful. All right, let's talk about different types of data because we're going to get to how people like to see it. So two types of dimensions, you know, qualitative, such as names of states, people, beers, and ordinal qualitative data, for example, medals in the Olympics, gold, silver, bronze, survey type data, love it, like it, hate it, so on. And then quantitative, your numbers, your measures, whether it's in dollars, pounds, percentages, or raw numbers. And again, this is just a generality. There are times when you're going to break the rules. But in general, this is the hierarchy. People like to see things First, remember those pretensive attributes? Position, then color, then size and shape. I mentioned some are more powerful than others. Here's your first clue to that. And this first part isn't so much about Tableau. It's about the science. But I did want to say that, that, that biology and psychology of our researchers went into making Tableau. So it's no coincidence that your columns and row shelves as we look top to bottom, left to right, that's your most powerful thing. That's number one, position. The next thing is color, then size. And then if you bring on more things, there is your shape. It's built in. You don't have to think about it. And you also may be wondering, uh, how do our eyeballs track to a screen? Let's say we have a dashboard, and we have four sections. Where do our eyes go? In general, your prime real estate is the top left. So if you've got important information, put it up there. If you're only, only using a bit of the screen, you could put it right in the middle. That's also prime real estate. But like I said, that's, that's the generalization. So I don't know if you saw in the data village, there were some eye tracking studies that you could take advantage of. Here's something that came out of the eye tracking study where they try to show some of the uh, things that go against the generalizations. One thing they found is that in a dashboard, and I'm going to play it in a moment, our eyes were drawn to big numbers. When I mean big, not like it's in billions, but the fact that the font itself is big and that it happens earliest in the viewing sequence especially the first time you look at the viz, so I'm going to play that. So you see it coming into focus. Those big numbers kind of pop out earlier. They came to several other conclusions, and when you see the slides, you'll see the link if you want to look at some of the other research they did. Okay. Congratulations, you passed the science part of this session. Now for the tips and tricks to help you apply what you just saw a little while ago. Lots of different chart types that Tableau is capable of making. One is a table. And it can be useful sometimes, especially when you need to see specific information. Like if this were a tax table, you had to look up a value or a bus schedule, really useful. But the magic of Tableau, really, is, is that we find that graphs are more powerful for spotting trends. So you can see playing in the background as I look at, again, we're not showing all the numbers. Maybe this is just an average. But if I want the detail, I can use things like tooltips. And last year, we, or during this year, we introduced Viz and Tooltip to show additional detail. But we can see the trend first. That's the thing that stands out. 
And here are some generalizations. If you've got something that's based on time, it should go on an x-axis. Location on a map, comparing values. You know I love the bar chart. It's more useful than most people give it credit for, and so on. And maybe you didn't realize this, that show me automatically enforces visual best practices. So if I just click on one thing and I go to show me, the, the graph types that you can use are actually enabled. The one that it recommends has an orange bar around it. And if I click more items, you'll see that they start pot, they light up because now you can use them. And with no cost and almost no time, you can find the visualization that you think tells your story the best. You don't always have to believe Tableau with the orange bar around it. You choose. So you've probably heard over time debates over you know, using pies versus bars. And in fact, the pie chart was not even included in some of the earliest versions of Tableau. It's not that our engineers weren't smart enough to build it. We just felt that we didn't want you to make a bad visualization because we just don't think that it's a very effective way to show data. And I'll tell you why. If you were to look at the, the pie chart on the left, and let's say we want to compare how we're doing us versus, let's say, competitor B, even though they're right next to each other, if I didn't give you the number, it would be very hard to tell. Just like I said, circle within the circle that we saw on that really uh, monstr that monstrosity that we saw earlier, hard for us to really precisely gauge sizes. But if I take those values in a bar chart and sort them, and now I don't even need to use all those colors, I'm just going to use those neutral tones and just use a darker gray so we stand out, you can tell that even without giving you the numbers that competitor B is just a little bit ahead of us. But I've actually been doing some reading lately, and there are times and cases where pipe charts are OK. I, I can't believe I'm saying this. I got to gather myself. OK. Um, some people like them because they're you know, like kind of soft looking. There's no axis, right? It's kind of simple. We see them every day. They're kind of elegant. They sometimes do well on a, on a map. You could do pies on maps in Tableau. And they work well maybe when there's just a few slices, certainly not a lot. And the donut chart is a variation where you kind of take out the middle. And you might even think that's better, because now you're getting rid of those sharp angles in the middle. But use a bar chart, please. But anyway, I let you choose. Stack bars are also a very effective way to, to show how you know, things are going to get sliced. For example, let's say we're looking at goal attainment. You know, here's a tip I would recommend. So let's say the three different, uh, the three slices are whether we've exceeded, whether we've met or missed our, our goals. The one that you want to, you want people, you want to stand out should be at the bottom because the bottom is really the only place where you can make meaningful comparisons. I mean, take a look at it. The light gray starts and ends at different places. It's really hard to, to measure exactly. Same thing, of course, or even more so with the dark gray items on the top. And another tip could be that, well, use an emphasis color. I used red in this case. Or when we've missed our KPI, and then I use the neutral colors for the others, so they kind of fade in the background. And I also made a choice that for any value above, let's say, 10%, I actually put the mark on the bar to really call it out. It's a little bit of a storytelling uh, method. So I started out showing that car dashboard, and I made fun of the gauge, and you can see gauges crossed out in the lower right-hand corner. And yes, if you go to Tableau Public, you could find people that have made gauges. If you really want one, they're there. Be prepared for a lot of math. <laughs> there is a lot of math because you're actually doing the calculations to make the circles and the radius, whatever, right? But Stephen Few created, and he's a big name in the data visualization space, 
uh, came up with the idea of what's called a bullet chart, and it's much more effective. It gives you real context. There's a lot of information here. So in this bullet chart, the thick black bar in the middle, I mean, that's where you currently are. But then you could have a comparative measure, that little hash line, reference line, if you want to call it that, that could be how you did last year, where your goal is, and then you can have quant uh, qualitative ranges like bad, satisfactory, and good with those neutral tones. And then we give it really a very definitive labeling so you know exactly what it is you're looking at. And these are really effective for executive dashboards because you can actually line up a bunch of them and then you can see where you're above and below your goals. Very effective. And as much as I love the bar chart, there are times when it's the wrong chart type to use. So if we're looking at revenue over time broken down by bookings and billings, the thickness of the, of the bars, the height of the bars, obscures the pattern in the data. But when I use a trend line, you can really see how they track against each other. It's much clearer. But with that said, that only works well with time, not other dimensions. So I've talked about pie charts, donor charts, getting hungry yet. Here's another chart type, the spaghetti chart. So I want you to try to avoid the food graphs if possible. And here I took some data and I decided to use brands of spaghetti for fun, since it's a spaghetti chart. And don't make any stock buying decisions based on this. This is completely made up data. But you can see why it's called the spaghetti chart. It's, the data is all there, but it's really hard to see any trends or patterns. So what can you do about this? I'd like to offer you three possibilities. The simplest one, get rid of the color, and then use Tableau's highlighter. Who knows about the highlighter? Few people. Yeah, it's, it's been around for a couple of releases. And as long as it's a static visualization, it will, I'm, it's not static. People can like choose Barilla. And there you go. It, it goes to the forefront. The others are grayed out. That's solution number one. Here's another one. We could create a calculation. Let's say we wanted to focus on Barilla. So I'm going to, again, take off the brand from color. And I'm going to take that calculation and put that one on color instead. And now, I mean, you don't have to, but I'm going to use some emphasis colors. I'm going to use emphasis color for the one I want to point out. And I'm going to neutralize all the others. So this will work more for a static kind of viz as opposed to highlighter. But there's a third solution, which is really a lot different, which I'd like to introduce to you and offer you where instead of having everything in one, you know, all the brands in one chart, I'm going to create what's known as spark lines. So each brand is going to get their own pattern. And then really it just comes down to some formatting. Maybe I just want to turn on the beginning and end values. I'm going to get rid of some of the headers. And we don't have to watch all of it. You end up with something like this. And if I wanted to, I could change the color for Barilla if that was the important one. But the idea being now, the patterns are no longer hidden. You get to see all of them at the same time. But a point I'd like to make about lines is, is that even if the data is time-based, it's not always fair to use it. Here's an example. If you're collecting toxin levels, but it's at irregular intervals, and I plotted it like this and connected the dots, is this really telling the story of the data? Now I'm going to show you what that data looks like. Not really, it doesn't really resemble the real data, does it? So what do you do in a case like this? I'm not showing you the only answer, but what you might want to do is use a dot plot instead. The idea being, again, our, 
our brains won't necessarily connect all these points. So it becomes more truthful. Using dual access is very popular, and it's probably meant more for an audience that is sophisticated. Here's something from a website of spurious correlations. There's a lot of funny examples. The number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates with films that Nick Cage has appeared in. All right, maybe he's a great actor, maybe he's not, but I don't think he causes people to jump and drown into pool, drown in pools. But the problem with the dual axis is that, for one thing, it makes your eyes dart back and forth, and that kind of slows us down. And then the worst part is, especially if you're not a sophisticated analyst, you might actually see this as having a correlation, but the problem here is, is that the order of magnitude of drownings is far greater than the number of movies that Nick Cage has appeared in. So you might want to simply have them in separate charts, one on top of another. That might be an easy solution. So if you're a new Tableau user, you might be wondering, I've got to find where in Tableau I can get a 3D visualization. You could look all you want. <laughs> you're not going to find it. And there's a reason for it, because of all the science that goes into making Tableau. We know that it suffers from the problem that we call data occlusion, meaning that data is hidden. So I'm going to try to stand close to the edge here and look down to try to find data for December of 1900. I, 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 I can't look down and see it. Well, the problem is it's a 3D representation on a 2D plane. I just can't do it. So somebody might try to outsmart me. Hey, Larry, suppose my software could spin the cube. That would do it. And I would say, nice try, but not exactly. Because the moment you spin the cube, guess what? You've now hidden the data on the other side of the cube. With Tableau, we say use something called small multiples. You could see multiple dimensions at the same time and see all the detail, like we show here using a tooltip. In fact, we're showing more data. The 3D chart is only showing every 10 years. Our viz is showing every year. You can see patterns in a viz made with small multiples. All right, let's talk about mapping. Now, I don't want you to come out of there and say, Larry told us not to use maps. I'm not saying that. I'm just going to say, just be careful. Maps are great when you have locations, states, cities, zip codes. But remember back to our hierarchy from a little while ago. The number one pretentive attribute, the most powerful, is position. That's the row and column shelf. But guess what goes there when you have a map? Latitude and longitude, that's spent. So you can no longer have bar charts and measure the length. You're now left with some weaker pretentive attributes like size, which we can get a general idea of which is bigger, but it's not precise, and color. And you know it's sometimes hard to exactly distinguish colors. But it is a very effective visualization to use. Uh, what I'm saying is don't always assume just because you have a geography you have to use a map. Sometimes a bar or other chart type will actually be better. But please use maps, because I don't want to get in trouble for management. When you have one measure, you could create what's called a choropleth. In Tableau, that we use a, more, a simpler name, a filled map. But this also suffers from a problem we talked about before. Remember this problem? Because, like in this example, we see Texas is dark. Our eyes might play some tricks on us unintentionally about the things that are around it. You can use a filled map. It's sometimes OK for generalizations. Now, for two measures, you're going to use a symbol map. The size of the circle is going to represent one measure, the color, the second dimension, uh, se second measure. But even if you have one measure, you might want to still use the symbol map, symbol map instead of the choropleth map. 
You know, think of Greenland. There are projection issues with maps, too. Greenland looks really big on a map. And when you put it in a color, you, you might start to think that it's more important than it really is in your overall map. But if you put a symbol on it, and that symbol is teensy weensy, you'd come to realize, all right, you know, let's say that's sales. Not a lot of sales in Greenland. But the cool thing with maps is you can actually use most any picture that you could turn into an XY coordinate. So here's a vis of a baseball perfect game showing where all the pitches went and whether they were strikes or put into play and so on. So you could do that with Tableau. Take a picture and map your data to XY coordinates and your picture is essentially a kind of map. Now this session isn't intended to be about storytelling, but I do want to impart upon you that as a visitor, you have the obligation to tell the truth with data. Kind of like that toxin level viz I showed before where you connect the dots, that's not really truthful. Here's another viz taken from the real world. It's about regulation of the cable industry. And I'm not going to make any arguments about whether it was good or bad. I just want you to look at this for a second and see if you spot anything that it may be untruthful just by looking at this. The dates, well, that's a great point. For one thing, the first bar has four years, the second bar has five. Not apples to apples exactly. And it's not even telling us if it's taking inflation into consideration. Now I'm going to show you what really happened. So actually, after regulation in 1992, there was great investment. But then it went down a little bit, maybe because of um, the financial collapse of that time. And then it went up a lot due to the dot-com com bubble. And then it actually sank again. So again, I'm not trying to argue the merits or demerits of you know, whether regulation is a good or bad thing. Well, I'm saying in this case, I don't think the visitor really told the truth with the data, and that's an obligation that you have. Next one I want to make is, you know, as great as Tableau's VizQL engine is, that's our secret sauce. It's what tells you what vizs are possible or not possible with your data when you go into Show Me. But you know, the default isn't always the best. So if I'm looking at drought data over time, broken down by states, you know, my default might look something like this. And this is a variation of the spaghetti chart I showed you a little while ago. What I'm trying to say is it's so easy and fast in Tableau to just try different things. Maybe it may take a little training to do some of the more advanced things, but not a whole lot. You're not going to break your data by trying things. So here's a much more effective visualization where it's really an array of maps where we can see visually trends over time. And sometimes they cross over years. So you can see where a drought might have started and ended. Or maybe it was very regional. That's hard to pick up in a line chart. Works well here. So far, I've really been focusing on you know, the single viz and best practices. But let's touch on dashboards a little bit, specific best practices there. Here's a rhetorical question. Are all dashboards the same? And what I mean by that is, you know, are there different types of dashboards? Of course, there's an infinite number of dashboards you could make. But let's say there are two types. And this, this is the belief of Andy Kirk, a visualization expert. He says the two types are explanatory and exploratory dashboards. We'll start with the exploratory dashboard. Here's an example. And we see these all the time. They're beautiful dashboards. Tableau does them very well. They help you monitor your business. We see the facts along the top. We see lots of trend lines, reference lines. You drill, filter. It's beautiful. But it's neutral, meaning when it's effective, 
It's really just begging for you to click in it and find your own truth, right? You're trying to monitor your business. It doesn't know ahead of time where the problems are. How many of you have seen this viz before? I'm just curious. It's been around a long time, half a dozen or so. It's a brilliant viz. It's an, a very sad viz, but it's, it's special in its characteristics. It's an explanatory viz, which means it has an opinion. It's, its goal is to make you feel something or to take some sort of action. The title could send shivers down your spine, Iraq's bloody toll. Now, this visor used a non-standard type of viz, actually. The x-axis for time is along the top. And normally, you might say, well, that's going to make it hard for people to understand. But in this case, there's no doubt, especially due to the red dripping blood, right? You know exactly what it's telling. But here's the interesting thing about an explanatory or opinionated viz. I can take the same viz and tell another story with it. In fact, I'm going to turn it upside down and put the x axis where you'd normally see it on the bottom. And now I'm going to change the title from Iraq's bloody toll to Iraq, deaths on the decline. And because I'm telling a, a better story, it's not a happy story, but at least it's good news, I don't really need the red color anymore. I'm going to make it neutral. You can't do that with an exploratory dashboard. That's unique to something that's explanatory. I hate to give you the answer. It depends for which one to use. But I would say this. Most people focus on the dashboard on the right. Wouldn't you say the ones that are exploratory? Tableau makes it really easy to drag in your your different views and put in filters and use actions to drill down. I think the more subtle and nuanced skill and the one I want to see you invest more time in is the one on the left where you can go to your management and say, I think we need to do this. We need to change our I don't know, product mix or change our discounting practices based on data. I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, the idea is that no matter which one you use, you want to make better data-driven decisions and really just change the world for the better, whether your world is in business, private practice, if you're a blogger, what, what have you. All right, now we get to the crux of the presentation. Remember the, the faces of being confused to saying, aha. How do you make a viz to pass the five second test. Here's a great example, finding Bigfoot. And I didn't know that we were gonna see so much of Sasquatch the other day, <laughs> but here it is again. But this viz is, is fantastic. The name is very good, it's very clear. We see a map, we know that we're looking at sightings, broken down by season, over time, and we get our factoids along the bottom. And here are some tips for making a viz for the five second test is we talked about real estate. Most important things should probably go upper left. Didn't talk about legends so much, but put them near the view and they shouldn't be really big. That just wastes a lot of space. Be careful about your color schemes. You don't want to make people's eyes go haywire with a lot of different color schemes. And the number of views, four or five maximum. I mean, you can go, be you can go more. I've seen good visits with 10 views. I've seen bad ones with two views, right? So it depends. And where you can, provide interactivity so people can drill and find more information. The next one is about using your words, and that's a double-edged sword. Um, what I mean by that is Edward Tufte, hands, who knows Edward Tufte or read books by Tufte? Very smart audience, good to see. He came up with this idea of data ink ratio which means as much as possible of your real estate should be focused on the data, not embellishments. So you know, in this case, notice even grid lines are barely visible, if at all. Since this is an executive dashboard, 
rather than going down to the penny level, we round it to, let's say, 6.43 million total revenue. That's good enough, and we use the letter M to hide all of the other values. We talked about using tooltips before. That's another way to show more information on demand without spending a lot of that data ink. You see some reference lines in the lower right-hand corner. You might be wondering, what about that, Larry? That's a good idea. Reference lines are helpful because it actually helps give you context for the data. Now I'm going to touch on some formatting and coloration. This is a viz by our own Andy Cotgreave. You saw him during Iron Viz and maybe attended one of his sessions. He won an internal Iron Viz contest with this submission, which is done kind of like in the style of a, I don't want to say it's a cartoon, but it's a panel, a bunch of panels. But also notice that he's using mostly line charts and line chart variations, like the upper right-hand corner is called the slope chart. But in the middle, and he's not just doing it for the sake of not using a line chart, he's showing, he's experimenting with the viz and saying a heat map of time is very effective here because it really points out when do most road fatalities occur. This is road fatality data. January 1st, Christmas, July 4th, they all stand out. But also because Andy knows that if you've got too many of the same viz, it creates kind of a visual exhaustion. So I'm not saying use five different varieties of chart types just to show how many chart types you can use. But when you have several on one page, you might want to mix it up a little bit. And finally, notice the effective use of color here. It's Bad news, road fatality, so he's using red, but he's also using a very soft color to, to make the emphasis color stand out. And when you're dashboarding for the five second test, I want you to get feedback. Because you're creating the viz, you feel somewhat married to it. I get that, but if you show it to others, whether it's if it's in business, you show it to your colleagues. If it's something you could show to your spouse, friends, whatever. Even if people don't know what business you're in, they should get the gist of it in five seconds or less. If not, go back to the drawing board. Um, you don't have to take every piece of criticism you get. And at some point, on the flip side, publish the viz. At some point, you've got to say it's good enough. But don't make that your final viz. Get, get more feedback even afterwards. There's always time for version two. So the last point I want to leave you with is, is beautiful design important? That's a question. Now, if you're just doing something for yourself to get a quick answer to something, VizQL in Tableau will give you a nice viz right out of the box. You don't have to format it. You're good to go, right? But I want to talk about what, what we're looking at here is, this is Method Soap. Uh, when it was first released, it actually had a leakage problem. But because of its anthropomorphic design, people decided it was something they wanted to put out in a place where people can see, rather than where soap usually goes, under the cabinet, right? So people were willing to overlook this defect because it was so beautifully designed. So when it comes to vizs, scientific studies have shown that a viz that is beautiful, people will consider it easier to use, more delightful, even if it may not be. So beautiful design is actually important. So spend time doing it if you can. So with that, I'd like to leave you with these resources. Here are some great books that I've read to help prepare for today's presentation. In the lower right-hand corner, you see something about training. So if you're new to Tableau, I really do urge you to go for desktop one training. And then this topic that we discussed today is in the visual analysis class, which if you can't get out of the office, we actually offer virtually in two and a half hour sessions over five days. So I thank you very much. I know you all have places to go, like the airport. Please take a moment, if you would,
and please fill out the survey. I hope you had a great Tableau conference. Safe travels. See you next year. Yeah.